So, uh, hi guys, I'm Kenti Iwasaki, I'm the CEO of Perlin. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about sort of a fresh new perspective on consensus protocols. But the main reason why being that um, there's quite a number of different flavors of consensus protocols out there, and we keep on having all these new blockchains coming out every now and then. But really, like, you know, actually, if you think about it from a developer's perspective, if you think about it you yourself, you want to make your own new dApp. There's just actually realistically no good sort of choices out there, realistically. And what exactly do I mean by that is that in the consensus protocol space, nothing's really ever sort of changed since the last past decade, ever since the sort of Bitcoin white paper came out. Uh, we've got all these new fancy blockchain projects. We've got Cosmos, we've got um, Algorand, we've got EOS, we've got Tenement, all of these other different kinds of projects, realistically. Um, the thing is that they're really just a couple of bells and whistles or some sort of slight twist to the existing uh, two canonical consensus protocol families. One being consensus protocols that utilize the longest chain rule or two, uh, those using election-based schemes. What exactly do I mean by election-based schemes? Uh, I'll talk a bit about that a bit later. But of course, like, you know, if I'm going to be bashing on consensus protocols, like what exactly is wrong with all of the existing ones? I, um, I kind of give a couple of re got to give a couple of reasons why exactly is that. Um, so let's go over like two of these different families, the longest chain rule and the election-based schemes. What are the pros and cons, and uh, so that you guys can kind of get a perspective, what exactly do I mean by uh, the trade-offs that these two consensus protocol families have is pretty insufficient for practical modern-day DAP development. So when we talk about the longest chain rule, what I typically mean by that, I'm talking about Bitcoin, I'm talking about Ethereum, right? Uh, talking about those blockchains that are known to be much more secure than a lot of the existing modern blockchains today. The reason why it's secure, it's pretty trivial why. It's very fact that within any blockchain that utilizes the longest chain rule, um, anyone is able to propose a block. The fact that anyone is able to propose a block um, and the fact that you know, no matter how many nodes you take down as an adversary inside Bitcoin, no matter the number of nodes, anyone can still process blocks, anyone can still work towards that proof of work such that they can get the right nonce to then generate transactions, propose blocks, and consensus is overall very, very secure. The safety model is very solid and grounded. Because of that, it's very decentralized. You can kill any number of nodes, it's safe, it's secure. Um, but the, the main cons, what's the main cons of the longest chain rule? Uh, inevitably, whenever we look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, though, the one thing we always dread or, or sort of look at is the fact that they really lack scalability. Um, you know, with Bitcoin processing, say, about 20-ish transactions per second, Ethereum processing about 40-ish to 50-ish transactions per second, that's sort of the main landmark that then kind of uh, got us into looking, is there any way we can scale up the transactional throughput, reduce the time to finality for these blocks and whatnot? Um, and of course, that then sort of started a whole evolution where we started looking into proof of stake, started looking into other kind of ways, other kinds of new blockchains, et cetera. And uh, yeah, uh, but before that, just going over a few other cons. Another thing is that with the longest chain rule, the blockchains that utilize the longest chain rule, um, there's no real good ways. It's pretty tricky to actually be able to achieve civil resilience. What I mean by that is preventing civil attacks. Uh, with the longest chain rule, you can really only incorporate proof of work, per se, because proof of work is a great way to prevent flooding attacks, the OS attacks, for example. Uh, whenever you try to pair the longest chain rule with something like proof of stake, things start to break down pretty badly. So in 2012-ish, when like PureCoin, which was the first proof of stake coin, came out, uh, things went pretty bad. There were a lot of ways you could uh, launch economic incentive attacks to sort of just overall uh, cause all sorts of different adversarial attacks, like changing the states, uh, make, causing inconsistencies in the network, et cetera. Um, now, the, the one big thing I kind of am going to be bashing about next is election-based schemes. When I talk about election-based schemes, what I'm primarily talking about is any sort of blockchain you see out there that has the concept of a validator set. Um, whenever you hear of any blockchain that has 21 block producers, has 100 validators, has 1,000 validators, I'm talking about the guys like Cosmos, Cardano, Algorand, Hyperledger, Fabric, pretty much any of the modern blockchains you're talking about today, they, they've, got a pretty, they've got pretty horrible trade-offs in terms of safety, liveness, or scalability. What I mean exactly by that is uh, if you've been looking into the consensus protocol research and whatnot, uh, the BFT threshold, uh, less than one-third of 
all of your nodes in the network uh, can fail. And uh, as long as it's at least less than one third of the nodes, then your consistent protocol can still continue, still achieve consistency and liveness. When you talk about election-based schemes, that sort of Byzantine threshold, it doesn't apply to the whole network. So you've got a million nodes, all right? You've got a million nodes, but your validator said it's only 100 nodes. That means all you gotta do is you gotta kill 33 nodes uh, within the validator set and your entire blockchain is going to collapse, it's going to break down. Um, you scale it up to a thousand validators, it's just going to be a matter of you killing 333 nodes. So, so, and the point is, another big sort of problem is that it's got a significantly worse safety model in comparison to Bitcoin. Um, if all I've got to do, if, if a thousand validators, those thousand validators are responsible for validating all of the transactions in a network. When you think of the, long the longevity, when you want to scale up to public network where there's millions of nodes, if all you got to do is kill 100 nodes, kill 1,000 nodes, or kill 10,000 nodes, and realistically, in, in, in the real world, that's extremely simple. Byzantine doesn't just mean adversaries, um, as you guys might recall. It could just simply be nodes that crash, nodes that lose connection. Um, just these kind of little minor insignificances to a node's firewall, to a node's networking, would pretty much cause your entire network to halt. And it, it's still surprising. Like, with, we've got hundreds of millions of dollars on all of these different kinds of blockchains, and the reality is that we're still using them and still thinking that the trade-offs that you're making is something that we can live with. So, and on top of that, like, of course, they're prone to DOS attacks. Um, a lot of their safety and lifeness models in these election-based schemes, uh, they usually tend to rely on economic incentives, and economic incentives are a pretty bad thing to mix into a distributed system, realistically. Um, if you've got untrustworthy actors, it doesn't matter whether they're irrational or rational, it's just hard to kind of predict the next step, next move. Uh, you shouldn't really ever bring economics to try to fix your consensus protocol. That just kind of implicates that your consensus protocol is broken in the first place. Um, but okay, that's enough rambling for now. I hope you guys can kind of get to see the picture. Any kind of, any of the modern blockchains, you just gotta kill a couple of nodes and the whole consensus protocol will crash. You can see it with Cosmos, for example. You can see it with Algorand. Um, it's a controversy. I'm happy to debate about it post-talk, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, rather than complaining all the time, uh, the, the core just that I wanted to just kind of uh, put out there is that blockchains are something that are not solved yet. Um, everyone's talking about adoption. Everyone's talking about uh, the fact that we can improve things. Uh, but the reality is that blockchains are so broken right now. These safety thresholds that we have are very marginal. The scalability is horrible. How can we focus on adoption when the underlying tech is just completely broken? All right, you got these new products trying to use DAGs. Um, DAGs are still much too complex. All right, if you're a developer, you're, you're developing the blockchain full node. There's still one, um, this is just one simple computer science problem. Um, you've got one node with one, a DAG of transactions, and another node with another DAG of transactions. They're kind of out of sync. How do you efficiently synchronize two DAGs? How do you replicate DAGs across nodes? That's still an open computer science problem, all right? These new projects, um, if Bitcoin still hasn't been, still isn't necessarily 100% production ready, imagine how long it's gonna take for a DAG protocol to be production ready. Um, second thing is that if, you ever, if your protocol requires nodes to coordinate with one another anyway, so say for example, I'm, I'm gonna keep on picking on Cosmos a bit for example, or any PF, PBFT protocol, um, you've got nodes that basically vote, and then uh, you've got other nodes that tally up the votes, collect the votes from other nodes. Any kind of distributed coordination you've got, there's just a lot of edge cases that can make things go wrong, make your consensus protocol sort of collapse and fail. Um, you should try to prevent any sort of coordination between nodes as much as possible. Uh, but you know, we still got these new projects that keep on doing it, even Algorand, for example. Uh, the third is that um, this is actually something that's been stuck with Bitcoin, stuck with Ethereum for so long. Uh, if, you, if your protocol requires any sort of semblance of a difficulty system, any sort of fixed block time, like six seconds, a block gets finalized um, every six seconds, the big problem is that uh, that, that implies, implicates that your consensus protocol has pretty weak liveness guarantees. Uh, your protocol can easily fail or be corrupted across all sorts of different conditions, and the way, you t and the way you're trying to compensate that is by making it so that people are fixed to being in sync within six seconds. So that's what they call the partial synchrony assumption. Um, and the fourth thing, of course, I kind of mentioned it a bit, do try to prevent as much as possible from mixing any economic incentives in your consensus protocol. If your consensus protocol safety relies on economic incentives, you're, it, it's wrong. 
but right. So I'm going to talk about a fresh new perspective on consensus because we've only really had these two sorts of big families of consensus protocols, the longest chain rule and also um, basically these electoral based schemes. Uh, what I want to specifically talk about is something that really only a few other projects have been working on right now, IOTA, Avalanche, and in particular, us as well, um, over here at Perlin, uh, specifically the notion of probabilistic consensus. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate this new protocol that we've actually been in development for from quite some time. I haven't talked about this to anyone else outside in the community at all as of yet, only under a few pri private guys like, say, Vita League, say, uh, Howard, a couple of our investors as well. Um, let's just define the problem of consensus first. Like, for my definition, what is the problem that I'm personally trying to solve here for consensus? The problem scenario is simple. Imagine you got a bunch of nodes in a network, like you got a thousand nodes or something like that. Everyone starts at block zero. It's the genesis block, right? Uh, basically, uh, what they're trying to do then is they're trying to figure out, all right, let's try to come to consensus what exactly is block one. Uh, let's say there's like two different candidates for what block one ought to be. Uh, let's call them like C0 and C1, uh, candidate block zero, candidate block one. And uh, realistically, in a real network, there's not just going to be two, two candidate blocks. Uh, we're just simplifying the scenario for now, and we'll expand it on later on. And let's say like uh, two-third of all of the nodes in our network uh, prefer candidate block zero, one-third of all of the nodes in our network prefer candidate block one. Um, and let's, let's ground ourselves down a bit the way networking works realistically in the real world. Um, if I had a million nodes, let's say, um, I can't talk to a million nodes at once. Let's just say I can only talk to about 16 of them at once. Uh, you know, like a realistic network connection. I can't talk to everybody at network at once. That's, that's uh, impractical. Uh, there's two objectives that I want to put out for consensus. On a local objective, for me as a node personally, what do I want to achieve? Well, one is that I want safety. Um, there's two candidate blocks, uh, block zero, block one, candidate zero, candidate one. Um, I want to be sure that if I do pick a C0 or C1, I do so with very, very, very high confidence, something like 99.99999%. There should be a minuscule chance that um, I don't have any confidence um, at all in choosing one of the can blocks to be block one. Um, the second thing is liveness. Um, if I do if I am trying to accomplish getting a very high confidence in choosing can block zero, can block one, I want to be sure that I, I actually do get that confidence as fast as possible. It's impractical if my consensus protocol, um, it takes me one year to figure out whether or not I'm choosing candidate block zero, candidate block one. It's got a, the algorithm needs to terminate as fast as possible. Um, now, the global objective, of course, is uh, two thirds of all of the nodes in the network um, already prefer candidate block zero. Realistically, like I should sort of tend towards the majority. What block one should realistically be finalized on all of the nodes to be kind of block zero. Uh, that's just sort of the scenario the problem set up here. Um, now, when we talk about uh, probabilistic consensus mechanisms, I would have to say that one of the most interesting ones would be the one that was proposed by Avalanche, which is snowball sampling. Realistically, it's got origins all the way back to 1960. It was a statistical sampling technique, though the Avalab's team, what they did is they personally scaled it up to being a distributed systems protocol or an algorithm. Um, and I'll kind of go over very quickly how exactly snowball sampling works. So uh, these are just a couple of parameters for you guys to keep in mind. You don't have to remember them right now. I'll go over them for the next slides. So, so let's say that we're at round zero. We're going to start our first sampling. 70% uh, of the network, uh, sorry, 66% uh, of the network, or two thirds of the network prefers candidate block zero. Uh, one third of the network prefers candidate block one. Um, what I'm going to do in, in the first round of sampling is I'm going to query k peers. k is something like 10 peers. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them, hey, what is your preferred candidate block? Uh, we know that two thirds of them prefer can block zero, so hopefully some amount of them are going to give us back can block zero. Maybe some of them would give us back can block one. Depends on who we choose to query, right? The K peers in this case. Um, now, what I'm going to do next is out of those uh, K candidate block proposals I got, uh, which I queried, is I'm going to check uh, what is the majority candidate block uh, that seems to be represented in the in the K peers that I queried. 
Um, if specifically if greater than alpha k, alpha is a number 80%, k is 10, so 80% of 10 is just 8, right? If more than 8 out of 10 of the peers that I queried, or more than 8 out of 10 of the kind of block proposals that I got, uh, specifically are of the same type, so is, it, is a candidate block zero, a candidate block one, I'm going to say that for round zero, the very first round of sampling that I'm doing, uh, the majority candidate block uh, that I got from my K peers is probably uh, candidate block zero, candidate block one. Let's say it's candidate block zero. Um, the next step I'm going to then do is uh, I've got this, like, this little table where I'm tallying how many times out of the K query samplings I'm doing um, that I, I saw canon block zero as the majority or canon block one as the majority. All right, so you'll keep on doing these rounds consecutively on and on and on again. Um, eventually, as you go, go on about, uh, the thing is that, of course, other nodes can also be querying you as well. Uh, the thing is, what do you respond as your preferred candidate block? Uh, basically, what you do is you look at that table you, of tallies you, looked at, you, you drew again, and you're going to uh, find uh, which one is the which one has the highest score? So does candidate block zero have the most tallies, or does candidate block one have the most tallies? Uh, the one with the most tallies, you'll you'll basically respond to other peers trying to query K peers. Uh, that like, hey, this is what I think is the right uh, candidate block to be block one. I'm trying to finalize block one just to ground things down again. Um, and finally, like, how does snowball terminate? How does the sampling uh, algorithm terminate? It's basically like. Um, so there's the whole thing where I'm shifting between candidate blocks. Am I going to finalize candidate block zero or candidate block one? I'll make a decision, basically, if for 150 consecutive rounds, and I emphasize consecutive sampling rounds, um, if I get the same majority candidate block, then I can basically say that, like, look, I, the network keeps telling me that uh, candidate block zero is, is the majority uh, candidate block for block one. So I'm going. If I get this consecutively 150 times, I can be very, very confident. It's a very high probabilistic bound that, all right, uh, canon block zero is basically what block one ought to be. Uh, that, that's the end of Snowball. And it sounds like a pretty good protocol because uh, you, there's no distributed coordination, none of the other problems that all these other blockchains have. Um, but, but let's be a bit realistic here, actually. Uh, Snowball consensus protocol, that, the protocol actually has uh, quite a few problems. Snowball inherently is what, in statistics, what they call a sampling mechanism. And there's a whole field in statistics about all these different kinds of sampling mechanisms. Uh, basically, trying to derive an opinion about a population. Um, the one big problem is that is what they call the cold start problem. And this has been studied in machine learning, signal processing, um, any kind of statistical field uh, you, you'll probably see. Uh, basically, um, the whole point is you declare a majority candidate block in one of the rounds. If it's greater than alpha k, alpha, if 80% of the 10 peers you query, uh, you can model this as a hypergeometric distribution. And uh, you know it, it, it kind of looks a little scary, the, the equation there. So um, I can simplify it out a bit for you guys. I'll, I'll plug in the numbers for you. Basically, it's saying like uh, two, -thirds of, two thirds of all of the nodes, of 2,000 nodes, has kind of block zero. One third of all the nodes has kind of block one. Uh, and then you can, like, you know, you can like, stick this in Wolfram Alpha or something. Um, and if you're able to see that, basically it says this. Uh, quantitatively, um, even though 70% of all of the nodes in the network uh, prefer canon block zero, uh, they believe canon block zero should be block one, you still only have a 30% chance of being able to actually do a proper successful uh, sampling round. Um, that probability is extremely low. So then the thing is, uh, what's wrong with Snowball? The problem with Snowball is that you might have to do over, say, 10,000 or 100,000 sampling rounds, which is very inefficient. It's less efficient than any of the other consensus protocols out there. You've got to pass around so many different messages, do a lot of samplings to actually get that high confidence bound. What I mean by that is, basically, if I go all the way back to the, to the scenario where like, I want liveness, I should prefer either C0 or C1. Uh, with utmost confidence as fast as possible, it's slow. It, it, it's not doing what I want. But all right, <laughs> let's just keep Snowball here as a primitive, all right? Uh, Snowball here is a little primitive. Let's go on and talk about what's, what's sort of new, what we're going to be contributing here from Perlin in this case. Um, so what we developed at Perlin is arguably the simplest probabilistic blockchain protocol. It's simpler. Significantly simpler than basically even Bitcoin or Ethereum. 
in this case. Uh, we, we call it uh, Project Himitsu. It's something that we've been developing for the past six months-ish. Um, and the reason why we say it's simplest, the protocol only has two steps. Two steps being uh, what a node has to do is just propose a block and finalize the block. If you look at any other consensus protocol, they've got way more steps than this. Uh, so going back to the scenario of what are we trying to do here, we're trying to figure out what is block one supposed to be. So uh, before going into what each of the steps mean, proposing a block and finalizing a block, uh, let's just talk about how transactions are created and stored in this case. Every single node maintains a mempool. A mempool is just a fancy name for a sorted array of transactions, all right? And basically, uh, it's a sparse array, so there's indices from zero to two to the power of 256 minus one, so it's, it's a huge sparse array. And basically, every anyone can make transactions, and uh, what we'll do as a node is every time we receive transactions, we'll just uh, compute, plop a number, which is the hash, 256-bit uh, hash of the transaction ID concatenated with the latest block ID. So basically, the index in which a transaction goes in, uh, inside your mempool, is gonna be very, very randomized and stuff. That's, that's pretty much it. That's how nodes store transactions, you pull transactions, that's how you handle transactions. Now, step one of the protocol, it's proposing a block. Uh, the steps are very simple. If your mempool is empty, your node doesn't know of any transactions, then uh, try again later. Uh, maybe wait uh, 500 milliseconds, wait one second, try pull some transactions from your nodes. Uh, now, if the mempool is not empty, you've pulled some transactions from some nodes, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a, a block proposal. Your block proposal is gonna be whatever transactions are inside your mempool. Just stuff all your transactions inside there. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to uh, seed Snowball. You're gonna start the Snowball sampling algorithm and basically just, just basically, uh, yeah, that's your initial preferred candidate block. Uh, here, here's the thing, here's, well, step two then is that you run Snowball. Snowball will converge, hopefully, and then uh, you're done. Uh, that's pretty much your entire blockchain protocol. You'll finalize block one, and then you can go to block two, block three, block four, whatever. Um, but remember when I said that Snowball had problems? Um, and Snowball still has the cold start problem. What about the cold start problem? And the second thing also is uh, there's not only two candidate blocks anymore. Uh, the thing is, like, let's say I had 37 transactions in my mempool. I'll make a block proposal with 37 transactions. Uh, let's say that I have... Uh, you know, you think of all the other nodes out there. Realistically, nodes are always relatively out of sync with each other. One node might propose a block with 47 transactions. Another node might propose a block with 100 transactions. Uh, if there's 1,000 nodes in the network at one single time, there might be 1,000 unique block proposals. Snowball only works with, can only work with two block proposals. How do we extend Snowball to work with multiple candidate blocks at once? Well, this is sort of the secret sauce. This protocol is so simple, but it actually lets you do something to Snowball so that you can solve the cold start problem. While you're querying those K peers in your snowball rounds, what you're gonna do first is you're gonna filter away all of the candidate block proposals um, that, that contain lists of IDs of transactions uh, that you do not have in your node. So let's say I only know 37 transactions, but I received a block proposal that had 47 transactions, and I don't have some of the transactions in that block proposal. I'll just filter it away, I'll ignore it, I'll nil it, and uh, you know, eventually, if I, when I do get the transactions in that block, then I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. I'll consider it in the, in the case snowball queries I'm doing again. And the second very, very most important thing is what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna weigh all the candidate block proposals after I filtered away all the other candidate block proposals by the number of transactions inside them. So what I'm left with uh, when I perform one single snowball round is I basically have um, all blocks all block proposals in which I have the, transac um, I have the transactions of, and uh, I'll basically weigh, I'll say the majority color, or sorry, the majority candidate block for that round is the block with the most transactions which, uh, containing transactions that I have firstly on my node. If you do this, this actually solves the cold start problem. Why? Simply because now I'm officially declaring that there's always a majority candidate block in every single snowball round. You do this, Snowball can now continue, Snowball can finalize. Uh, you can have any number of block proposals you want, it doesn't matter. You, you just turn the binary consensus protocol, which Snowball is, into a, a, well, a, a multi-airy, multi an n-airy consensus protocol, and your whole blockchain protocol will work. And, all you got, and the only thing you gotta do as a software engineer to implement this consensus protocol is figure out how to implement a sorted array. That's pretty much it. 
Um, now, why does this work? Uh, why is this more scalable than all of the other consensus protocol? It actually takes advantage of a well-known fact about networking about distributed systems that no other consensus protocol takes into account. It's the fact that it knows that, that nodes um, take time to learn tr about transactions. Uh, nodes are always constantly out of sync. If we, take, if we consider that fact, um, basically, uh, every single time we perform a single snowball consensus round, the fact that we're always ignoring, filtering away all blocks which, which we don't have transactions of, we can basically scale up accordingly as fast as possible to perform snowball rounds as quickly as possible. So the result is that the block that will then always finalize with snowball uh, will always contain transactions which the majority of all honest nodes have. Doing that, basically, we always tend to favor the majority. The majority nodes always win. And even if an adversary tries to come in and flood the, tra the network with, with transactions, it won't matter at all. So we can still achieve fast BFT finality, even though uh, one third of the nodes are compromised. Doing uh, what about proof of stake? Um, you know, remember we recall just weighing all the block proposals by uh, the number of transactions inside the block? All you gotta do is apply another set of weights, just simply weigh the block proposals uh, by the stakes of the peers that we queried, the K peers that we queried. Um, that's pretty much it, and you've got easy, quick uh, proof of stake uh, and civil resilience. And there are actually plenty of other ways. You can make new kinds of weights. You can apply to the block proposals, all of these kind of things. There's a lot of ways you can be creative now that you've got, you're just using sampling as a consensus algorithm. So, so the conclusion then is that you've got really practical scalability in this case. In our benchmarks, we've received 31,240 TPS over a public network with a lot of uh, a latency, zero to four second finality. Uh, we have very strong safety finality to the extent of Bitcoin because we've got 99.9999% confidence bounds here in this case. Uh, transactions are totally ordered um, so, so that you can then support smart contracts. So it's very smart contract compatible or you can bootstrap whatever systems you want. You can even choose to use this consensus protocol for IoT if you wish. Um, it's also very cheap as well because all, each node just has to maintain a sorted array. Um, you only need to pull data from other nodes. You don't need to do any coordination amongst nodes. So the communication is very cheap. You can choose to expend as much bandwidth as you want. Um, so there's better DOS resiliency. It's easy to implement. There's very few edge cases. And the last bit, it's very easy to extend. Um, if we just look into sampling as a consensus mechanism, we can use all the existing techniques that we've had. Sampling's been researched for the past 100, 200 years-ish. All of those techniques can actually apply into using this to actually garner consensus with very strong confidence boundaries. And the next steps then is, well, this pretty much solves consensus to the best of my knowledge to, to the extent that, that we're looking for. We want fast finality, strong safety, right? There's, there's no trade-offs in this case. It's a matter of, we can start looking deeper into what are the bigger problems in the blockchain space. How do you do secure state syncing? But no protocol has done secure state syncing yet. We can start looking into that. Um, after your network partition, say for example, you know, one of the governments, they isolate all of the nodes in a single territory so that they cannot communicate with the outside world. Um, is there any ways we can resolve those kind of network partitions? Nobody's really got a good solution to that yet. Um, zero knowledge proofs, can we reduce the redundancy of computations? If the only person who has to compute, uh, who has to run a smart contract function is just the transaction sender, then not all of the nodes have to run the smart contract functions or re uh, replicates uh, the invocation of a smart contract function. Doing that, uh, that's, that'll be really helpful. And the final bit is uh, we're finalizing the formal proofs right now for the protocol. Uh, we have closed form probabilistic bounds at the moment on to what guarantees of safety we have with this new protocol. And it's just a matter of doing some formal verification proofs, et cetera. Um, with this new protocol, what we're gonna be doing next is we want to actually open up a consortium. Uh, we feel that consensus protocols are not something that we should just like keep private to just one project. What we actually want to do is that there's a lot of projects that come to us or that we, we see out there um, that are quite frustrated with the fact that they use DPOS, they use some PBFT, they use all of these consensus protocols or by these big major companies with $300 million market caps and they're saying like, you know, these things actually don't work. Uh, is there anything else I can use out there? For those kind of projects, what we want to do is we want them to come in 
um, join our consortium. Uh, we're cre curating a cu consortium at the moment where what we're gonna do is we're gonna give them access to the full node code. We're gonna give them access to a simulator code which is written in about 500 lines of Go code. Uh, we also got a Python simulator out. Well, we basically want people to vet the code for themselves, see that the whole thing works as it is. And if they like it, they can choose to adopt it for their project. Uh, it's not gonna be like tied to our tokens or anything. What we, we seriously just want people to uh, ignore the consensus problem once and for all, consider it solved, and just so that it can start working on much more adoptable use cases. Um, if you're interested, reach out to me. My email is right over there. And on top of that, uh, our mainnet's gonna be scheduled to be released uh, on our personal note on 2020. And on top of that, uh, we all, we're, we're a project that does a lot of stuff on WebAssembly. Uh, we're one of the sort of uh, first, first foregoers with Parity and also uh, the near product on Oasis on WebAssembly virtual machines. So do check us out on that. There's gonna be a workshop at 2 p.m. today. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs>